India has been a significant market for many years. It is diverse culturally. It has 15 agroclimatic zones, varied food preferences, and a strong presence of traditional grocers who serve over 1,300 million consumers, a rapidly growing large format retail segment, and an equally fast growing e-commerce channel. And then you have multiple well-run businesses who offer value through cost competitive products. And on the other hand, you have global giants who have served Indian consumers for decades. All this makes India both attractive and throws up multiple challenges from regulatory to manufacturing to distribution, commercial, and finally understanding the diverse Indian consumer. How do corporations widen the reach of their offerings and at the same time drive depth of consumption in a market which is still kind of underserved on one hand and has challenge of disposable incomes amongst large number of consumers on the other. Some of these challenges were addressed by thinkers who wrap their heads around this. And like all our episodes, I'd like to introduce a thought leader. In this case, Professor C.K. Pralhad, an alumni of Loyola College Madras and Harvard Business School from the University of Michigan. His masterpiece is the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid eradicating poverty amongst many of his classic pieces. I mention him because his ideas will return to embellish this episode shortly. An institution which has navigated this difficult journey and gained admiration is Hindustan Unilever, previously known as Hindustan Lever. Hindustan Lever is widely acknowledged as a company that creates and retains consumers using one of my favorite quotes, delivering attractive financial returns, and all this with a reputation of being ethical. However, like all large corporations, the weight of history, rapidly changing markets, choice of products have created headwinds which needed to be beaten. Today's episode is about that journey and how did this monster of a company reinvent itself. My guest to tell the story is Nitin Paranjpe, Chief Operating Officer of Unilever in London and the former CEO of Hindustan Lever. Nitin, Welcome to Dialogue with Peers. It's a great pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much, uh, Shubroto, for having me on this uh, uh, on this episode. I have to mention at this point that I joined Brookbond a few years before you did. So I have a degree of familiarity with this marvelous company that you ran. And though our experiences are similar, but they're over different time periods. And for those who have not heard from you, why don't we start by you telling us something about how you joined the company and your early days? Oh, that does go back a long, long time. I've been with this company for over 30 years. But uh, I have to say that um, when I think back, um, from the time I was in business school, this was uh, probably the dream company for uh, most of us to join. Certainly for me, I would have given an arm and a leg if anyone had mentioned to me when I was in business school that I would uh, be selected by this organization. Uh, such was the uh, admiration, such was the respect, such was the iconic status that this company had at that point in time. Um, so when I happened to get into this company, uh, my only thought, as strange as it might sound now, my only thought at that moment was to uh, make sure that I demonstrated that I belonged, that uh, people didn't discover after recruiting me that I was, uh, as you would say in statistics, uh, type two error. You've chosen someone thinking uh, he or she is good and it turns out to be otherwise. So uh, my early days were simply this. I was delighted that I was uh, recruited. Uh, I uh, spent all my time in the early days just to make sure that uh, I focused on what I was doing, uh, I demonstrated that I belonged, and uh, I justified the selection which had been made. So that's how my uh, my start was. And it wasn't like many other people who might join in and say, oh, I've come in and I want to become uh, so-and-so in so many years and I want to get to this level, I would like to be the CEO. And I did find several people like that, but for me, um, I simply was uh, so grateful that I was a part of this organization and I wanted to make sure that I didn't let anyone down. The company was famed for uh, its training program. So like everyone else, I went through what was then an 18-month training program going through various stints, 
across various functions. And the first thing that all of us were required to do was to go out and work like a, like a salesman, making in those days 40 calls a day in temperatures which were often north of 40 degrees. So I was sent to a, a UP and my first, uh, within a week of uh, joining the company, I went there and uh, trained in a place called Saranpur and um, lived in allowances, which uh, frankly, uh, I can't even begin to imagine how it was possible in those days to live uh, in those allowances. But the whole spirit was that you lived on the allowances of a salesman. So you lived in the same type of hotels, you ate the same type of meals, and you were discouraged, even if you had the means to spend yourself and uh, uh, live a different life. And this whole thing was designed to help you understand the life of the territory sales in charge, as we had, uh, we used to call the person. What did it mean? And uh, you did the job. You did. You replaced one TSI. You did every single day what the person would do. Forty calls a day. One town, once uh, every day, to moving from one town to the other. And it was hard work. And I have to say, there were moments during that period when I wondered, after studying engineering and uh, doing my MBA, uh, what had I got myself into? But uh, thankfully, those moments were infrequent. And as everyone had told me, it probably was the hardest stint, but the most uh, value-adding stint, which you can look back and see how much you grew and how much you learned. I started off after my training as a sales manager once again in Eastern UP. And uh, uh, for those of you who might not have been there, it is, uh, it is quite a place. It certainly was in those I, days. I, 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 I have done Eastern UP in a similar program seven years before you. Yeah, so uh, it was quite a place. And uh, I had credit to the organization that uh, straight out of college, uh, a little over a year into your training, you are being put into uh, a region which was Eastern UP as the sales manager with uh, 10 or 15 uh, uh, territory sales in charges, two or three sales officers, and a network of over 100 distributors to manage. I sometimes, in hindsight, think that is uh, probably almost irresponsible giving so much responsibility to someone so young in those days. But that was the job. And uh, I have to say, if I was to, at the end of 30 years of my uh, working life, if I was to call out a handful of roles, maybe my first role would be one of those roles which. Uh, which challenged me, which grew me, both as a professional and as a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, just the fact that you were responsible for so many people. And uh, for all the people out there, you were the company. You, um, the, and it was, uh, it was a heady feeling, a responsible feeling, a tough job. A tough job when you had to deal with uh, the sorts of things which I'd never imagined. I'd, I saw for the first time in my life that um, that a demand draft could bounce because oh. it could be forged, that commercial oh. controls meant something quite different, that uh, we were taught that if a check bounced and you stopped doing whatever you had to do and go and make sure that your goods were safe and you collected, uh, took it back. And when I went and tried doing that, I was confronted with a distributor who, uh, who was not troubled at all. He had a smile on his face. He put some uh, uh, tea and asked me if I'd have some cashews and nuts, etc. And then uh, in the same breath, along with all the files that we were all maintaining in those days, put them on the table and takes out a little um, revolver and keeps it on one side and says, what is it that I was interested in? My God, as a young 24-year-old uh, experiencing this, I beat a hasty retreat. I had... <laughs> But those are the sorts of experiences which uh, harden you, toughen you, and make you realize uh, how you deal with uh, people, how you deal with situations in that context. So I narrate these only to uh, because I hadn't thought of this for a while, but since you asked me uh, about these, yeah. these thoughts come back uh, uh, almost as if they, were, they happened quite recently. Nitin, tell me the next stage in your journey. I then went as a brand manager, and I went as brand manager for uh, probably what was the smallest brand in the company at that point in time. It was a brand called Vim. 
Um, and uh, I don't want to sound immodest. I had a reasonably good uh, sales management stint. I was amongst the first people who moved from being an ASM into becoming a brand manager. And you know how silly one is when one is young. Yeah. All of these are these uh, stupid signals that you say, ah, I was the first guy who was made a brand manager, etc. Is in, and uh, so it felt good. And so in the early days, I wasn't too troubled that it was the smallest brand that I was uh, working on. And uh, but six months later, eight months later, many of my other colleagues started uh, moving, and some of them moved to much bigger brands. And a year, two years later, I said, God, what is this? I'm probably working on the most inconsequential brand in the company. And uh, I remember going and uh, uh, talking to my boss in those days. Uh, he was Vindi Banga, and he was uh, a remarkable man. And I said to him, am I not good enough? I'm, uh, I still work on a very small brand, and there are so many others who are working on uh, big brands, Surf, Me, Lifeboy. And he looked at me and said, um, Listen, if you want to move to a bigger brand, I would move you. But uh, I thought you were bigger than that. You know, the size of the brand and the what you can learn and how you can grow are not correlated. Yeah. And he said it. I respected him, so I uh, listened to him and I didn't say anything else and I walked out. But I have to admit that I wasn't 100% convinced. At that moment, there was still a little bit of... Uh, uh, no doubt in my mind, but I respected him too much. So I said, I'd give it a shot. And I genuinely see it from the lens that he had uh, suggested. And I cannot tell you how much I learned in the five years. I must have been on the smallest brand and probably the longest brand stint. Most people at two and a half, three years would be moving, say, what next, etc. I was on that business for five years. Yeah. And uh, probably got a chance to learn and do more on that brand the, than I ever would have if I was working on a bigger brand. Uh, partly because if you were working on some of the big brands, um, everyone had a point of view. Everyone wanted to see everything. And you had, and uh, the advantages on the small brand was that uh, I got a chance to take many decisions. That's right. Partly because there was very little I could do to screw things up. It didn't matter so far. But I got a chance to do a lot. Uh, and that helped. And probably because I suspect my bosses might have been feeling a little guilty that they didn't have time for me. Uh, yeah. I got away with whatever I asked for. The answer was yes. And I learned. I made mistakes. And I grew. And uh, the truth of what Wendy said was apparent for me at the end of uh, that four or five year period. And it taught me something else. It is not the job that defines how good or bad it is. I've, I came to the conclusion that every job is a great job. It is just a different job. And since that day, I've said, the job that I am doing at that moment is the best job in the world. And that's the lens that I started bringing in uh, to what I did. But uh, that first stint was also very uh, informative and a stint for me and a, a learning stint from an organizational point of view as well. Because uh, two or three different things happened in those first five, six years. First, I was delighted to be in the headquarters of this company where there were many senior leaders and uh, people like uh, Wendy and others who were around. And we as youngsters would be, uh, uh, would be just... Uh, uh, waiting to hear them. They were so inspiring. They were so, um, um, and role models in so many different ways. And uh, yet one day I observed something which troubled me. One of the people whom I would look up to and I would be inspired by and who was a source of such energy, suddenly I found something felt different. Something felt different. The same person who was uh, positive, enthusiastic, inspiring, energetic, suddenly sounded cynical, bitter. Uh, and I failed to understand what was happening. Mm -hmm. Till a few days later, the penny dropped for me. And the penny dropped for me and I realized 
that uh, as this organizational pyramid starts narrowing, something had happened mm. and the organization had taken a decision. And this person was for the first time on the wrong side of the decision which was being made. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was troubling to observe now that this person who talked about meritocracy and how this company uh, puts merit uh, above everything else suddenly uh, had words like favoritism and bias and things like that. And uh, I thought to myself, how, how, um, how at times our personal feelings can cloud our judgment. If this company was all about, about uh, favoritism and bias and things like that, then does this person not realize that the last five times he got promoted was also an account of favoritism right. and bias? How come every time the decision was in your favor, it was meritocracy. The first time it is not in your favor, you suddenly talk of favoritism and uh, bias. That was a huge lesson for me. And I thought to myself that the numbers game is such that one day as the pyramid gets narrow, someone will get ahead of you. Someone who's better, brighter, or certainly someone who's more appropriate for the job and the context that the company is facing at that moment. And I have to be big enough to understand that and to realize that it will happen and never ever huh, allow myself to become cynical or bitter because there is no company in the world which is worth allowing you to become bitter because when you become bitter, you first destroy yourself and then you destroy people around you. It's a bit like cancer. It erodes you. And that's really what I learned in my very, very early stage. And then I did something to say that this is all very easy to uh, uh, to talk about, but you have to prepare for this. So I said that I must now start identifying someone. I must have been five, six years in the company then. Someone who might be younger than me, who might have joined more recently. But I observe qualities and traits in that individual, which I never demonstrated when I was two years or three years in that company. Mm -hmm. And then say to myself, if this person ever grows and ever becomes my boss, I should not feel troubled. I should not feel uh, concerned because that person is showing qualities which I never did at that point in time. All of this was to just to keep me grounded and to train me for the reality of an organization. Nidhan, I just want to say that what I find fascinating is that the center of your professional career the fulcrum of values and human values. Uh, you have deep preferences for investigating and reflecting over these issues. And so, on, as this journey continued and you went along, how did you look at businesses and corporations you ran? How did you bring your personal experiences as a management trainee and an area sales manager, brand manager, uh, about managing talent? When you reflect over your own experiences, uh, your experiences with your mentors, what were your observations and how did that uh, kind of crystallize your thoughts and how do you convert it into something that you made real around you? So then I two. so firstly, I was blessed. I was blessed to have great, uh, great bosses uh, over my career. And uh, I also had the, um, a nature, nature to uh, to uh, reflect on a few uh, incidents and things. And I found that uh, there were two which strike me at this moment, which had a considerable impact on me. One of them was a very, very innocuous interaction. I remember my boss in those days was Harish Manwani. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us would know him. He was in this company for mm -hmm. long. And uh, I had sent him a proposal and he hadn't got back to me for two or three days. Uh, and uh, when you're young, you're impatient, you thought it was the best thing that you had done and you're waiting for some response. And uh, I suddenly saw him when he was walking past the corridor and I looked at him and said, Harish, uh, I seized the moment. I said, Harish, I'd sent you the paper. I haven't heard from you. And he may have been just going to the washroom. He had literally two minutes. He said, yeah, yes, uh, I've seen it. And he uttered one sentence and he walked away. And that sentence was, yes, uh, Nitin, I've seen it. Uh, I think it's short of your usually high standards. Mm. That was the only line he uttered. 
and he walked to <laughs> he didn't make a big deal about it nothing he just said that and i went to and i went back oh, oh my god uh, and as i thought about what he said he had done two things very cleverly the first was saying usually high standards making me believe that i'm capable of better things yeah mm -hmm. but equally in this nice way which only harish could do he was basically saying that it was it was a crappy paper which i had submitted yeah? Yeah. that's really what he was saying and i thought to myself as to what sort of a reputation would i want to have in the organization would i want a reputation where when people see my name at the bottom of a paper they would say oh uh, this have a look at it carefully it's uh, pretty average mediocre and he's the sort of chalta hai guy somehow find a way to get by do that little bit or do i want my name to stand for something that i'm proud about it stands for a certain level of quality something that i am happy to put my name below and i that day decided to myself that uh, i would never want to hear that again yeah and if i hear it it's not because i haven't put in my effort behind it it is simply it was the best that i could do if that best is not good enough that's okay i can still feel proud about who i am and what i do yeah because i've never believed in that one maxim which sometimes as a child you're taught oh you have to be the best in the world you have to be the best in the world and i've never understood this i've always felt that it was terrible pressure on an individual because being in the best in the world is not up to you now being in the it's up to how good subroto is how good somebody else is but being that's not up to me but being the best that i can be is only up to me there is no one in the world who can take it away from me and i like it when the locus of control is within me it's not up to anyone else yeah and that's the only thing that i stood by and that's the only thing i expect out of people as well i hate it if i find that someone with ability doesn't put in enough effort that troubles me because the only thing we can do is to maximize the talent that we've been given the capabilities that we've got beyond that i don't expect anything short of that equally i don't expect i won't tolerate anything short of that so that's a personal value which i think that example hone which i try and uh, live by and the second example that struck me was again from one of my bosses again it was when the interesting thing who in one of my conversation just looked at me and i don't know why he said it he was you know he had this style and he looked at me and said uh, you know that an intellect is a great quality it can take you far but intellect combined with humility is an irresistible quality yeah well and he said that and again left it alone he didn't belabor the point he didn't uh, stress on it he didn't explain why he said that to me he didn't tell me that he observed me becoming arrogant but i went back and thought about all of this why did he feel the need to say this to me what had i done was i being arrogant did i have a chip on my shoulder and while i couldn't obviously find a situation i think the lesson that he had given me was absolutely spot on i'd been far too many people in the company who uh, who had that intellectual arrogance and i'd seen the downfall i'd seen how they became closed they were not willing to listen they were not open to the possibility that they could be wrong uh, and the and that was the second thing that uh, i said to myself that uh, i hope i'm able to live up to uh, that advice as i went forward so in my in my examples and in my early stint frankly i wasn't trying to do anything uh, very different i was who i was some things mattered to me um i deeply believed in good old fashioned middle class values of honesty integrity equity fairness and uh, somehow i uh, would uh, just wanted to see and just want hope that good guys don't have to come last that it is possible to be good and deliver exceptional outcomes why should there be a trade off and one, that was one. the only thing that mattered to me so to your mind uh, what have been your biggest challenges that you faced i could spend forever talking about uh, different forms of mistakes different uh, challenges which i had but probably to be 
fair and honest, if I was to address this, I would say somewhere in 2001, 2002, 2003, there was a period when I went through extreme difficulty, extreme failure if I had ever encountered uh, one. And what made it more difficult was the fact that, uh, again, without sounding immodest, between the time I joined the company for the first 14, 15 years, I was successful. I was by and large delivering every target that I had for myself. And uh, in a way, succeeding consistently for 14, 15 years is a good feeling, but it is also, uh, it, it is also not such a good thing because I wasn't prepared for what I was about to deal with. So in 2001, if I had always succeeded till then, over the next two years, there was not a single goal or a target that I set for myself and I committed to, which I managed to mm -hmm. deliver. You can imagine how stressful that whole period was. It was uh, probably the most difficult period in my, uh, in my uh, professional career. Uh, I went through... I went through self-doubt. I went through this whole period of really thinking, was I really as good as I thought I was? I, there were periods when I would get up at uh, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, toss in my bed, simply not knowing what else I could do. I was trying everything possible, and nothing seemed to work. And um, uh, it was a difficult period for the company as well. The company was also going through a, a difficult period. My boss was under pressure. The boss was under great stress. And the climate in this whole setup was also not something that I was enjoying. And um, in that, in, over those two or three years, two years really, I probably aged more and I probably learned more about myself uh, than I had learned in 15 years of success. The first thing I learned was that 15 years of success had made me a little complacent. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, when I looked at the issue that I, the job I was coming into, I knew it was a tough job. Uh, but somewhere in my mind, I said, yeah, sure, it might have been tough, but I've succeeded in so many roles, I'll come and fix this. Yeah. And therefore, I was, I simply did not acknowledge the severity of the issue. Hmm. And I thought I can come by and do some, a little tactical situation here and a little bit there. Uh, without realizing that the problem required a structural response, a bolder structural response, which I simply was not willing to take. And as time went by, I discovered that that structural response was expensive. I never had the courage to take that response because it felt too, uh, too tough, too expensive. And the longer I waited, I learned. I learned that expensive as it might have been a year ago, the cheapest it would have been was then. The longer I waited, the more difficult it became. It became difficult because the problem became bigger and moreover, the problem was my problem. Every time I talked about it, I felt defensive because it almost came across as a person who's doing all of this and now making excuses for what needed to be done. And uh, in all of this, I realized that, um, uh, I remember one morning after two years of trying various things which never succeeded, it was almost a sense of resignation. Resignation in terms of saying, cut it all out now. Just And I went back to almost the basics, to my deep inner beliefs. And it is a matter of some shame, as I recall now, that despite it being a core belief that I have harbored for a long period of time and have had, I didn't rely on it for the first two years. And the belief that I had was, if you do the right things, the right outcomes will follow. It is a law. And for me, it was a law like gravity. When you drop something, it will always fall down. So also, if you do the right things, the right outcomes will follow. And I'm ashamed to say for the first two years in that role, I wasn't doing the right things. I was trying shortcuts. I was trying tactical things, thinking I'm too clever, that I will find a way to fix it in that manner. And uh, like I said before, there are no shortcuts to long-term sustainable success. And it was only after trying every, every other option, I went back to doing what was the right thing to do. And thankfully, results started coming. And the beauty of getting results the right way is when they come, 
they're more sustainable and that's uh, and uh, therefore things turned around and uh, life improved and along with this probably there was one other lesson that i learned about people and people management mm. mm-hmm. um i saw what was happening in the business i could feel for my boss who was also under the same pressure but so was i mm. and i think all of us as a group was spending too much time mm, trying to explain trying to justify trying to as as you were questioned whether this was right that was right and um, and i thought at that moment mm, that that interrogation was not building belief in me it was actually adding to my self doubt and in the most difficult moments what what leaders need to do is not add to your subordinate self doubt but to see how you can instill belief and confidence because they are already feeling that doubt and no one in a war has ever won a war with self doubt so um, one of the things that i hoped i would be able to inculcate is in the most difficult periods and difficult moments that you go through is to be there to support be there to add belief and get people to genuinely think that you can win because that's when they need it the most they don't need there are enough there is the devil in your mind is enough sowing in our doubts you don't need it to come from other people as well nitin i want to circle back i think you have said a whole bunch of very important things uh, but you became the youngest ceo of hindustan unilever and there were challenges you alluded to some of them uh, did you get the time to prepare yourself for the job to when you got the job you realized that you were not prepared enough how was the experience of running this monster and what was the nature of problems i do not want the details because all that is in the public domain from your perspective if you could just flesh out some of these things it would be a great value to a lot of people who are watching this program so i was absolutely unprepared because uh, uh, i was unprepared I was you became the managing director of Hindustan Labor. Yeah, I was absolutely unprepared in the sense of uh, the suddenness of hmm, uh, the announcement because the previous person was there barely for one and a half two years. It wasn't as if uh, there was a transition which was uh, due to happen. People were wondering who the next person would be. But in organizations, at times there are events when changes take place which uh, are um, unplanned, so to say, because. and um, suddenly i was in bihar visiting a wholesaler uh, in the outskirts of patna when i get a phone call from a um, company secretary saying that find a way to come uh, to mumbai uh, are you aware that uh, harish is there tomorrow say yes i am there so i will be there in time i'm coming to office he said no 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 you have to be there before 8 o'clock i said it's physically impossible there are no flights and he said to me make the effort it will be worth your while i can't tell you any more and it was the most strange sort of comment and there were no flights i said how do i make the effort and re- get back and i found a way to get to delhi and then there was some uh, international flight those late uh, flights which is hopping flights from some place to some place i got in at 1 o'clock took some flight came to mumbai by 3 o'clock and landed in office to be told uh, Uh, by my boss that there were changes happening and he'd like me to become the uh, ceo of the company so that's how sudden this whole thing was mm-hmm. in that sense there before there was no question of being prepared uh, and having thought it through and what am i going to do over the next 90 days and things of that sort none of that was in place um i have to say it was also the most euphoric moment uh, of my uh, my career and yet also the most i was also scared at butterflies in my stomach because uh i realized the hopes and aspirations of so many people which uh, now were resting uh, on my shoulder so i was i was delighted but i was scared the next few days were like a honeymoon um and um, we know honeymoons don't last mm-hmm. uh, in my case uh, it didn't last too but honeymoons don't always end in a nightmare Uh, my early stage almost ended in a nightmare because uh, within months uh, 
of my taking over as the managing director and the CEO of the business. Uh, we had this global financial crisis and markets uh, collapsed. Crude came down from $130 to $30. Uh, the cha wholesale channels were choked. I realized uh, a whole lot of problems that uh, uh, in, my, in my many years of experience, if you were living in India, you always knew and you had learned how to take up prices because inflation was a part of life. I never, nobody in our business ever knew how to bring down prices. When crude came down from 130 to 30, we had to bring down prices. And it's damn difficult to bring down prices because the trade hates you for it. You're stuck with higher price stock in the trade. And, uh, and it wasn't modest. And the only thing I could say at that point in time, had it not been for my first failure, which I had gone through in 2001 and 2003, and the lessons that I had learned in that period, and what to do and what not to do, had it not been for an incredible team that I had, and everyone says that, but I genuinely mean it. It was not just a high quality team of professionals, but incredible human beings whose heart bled for the company. Yeah? And had it not been for, again, I don't know why, but uh, uh, a, a reminder of an incident which took place 10 years ago, an interaction with CK Pralat, probably two or three fortuitous things all coming together. I don't think I would have survived. And I don't think... So what did you learn from Pralad? Oh, that's uh, that's quite a story. I think uh, Pralad in 2000, and, uh, in 2000 actually, uh, I was a part of a project called Project Millennium and he was a board member of the company. And I think on one occasion, he, he was a professor. He liked teaching, he liked mentoring and uh, we were a, a few youngsters who would, he would sometimes spend time with. And he asked one question. And the question was quite, again, innocuous. Nathan, what do you think this company needs more of to be a, to be a greater company, to be a better company? And I was young and I was flippant and I said, oh, this company must be more enterprising. So, so what do you mean by enterprising? I said more risk taking, more this. And whatever I answered, it never really satisfied him. And he kept asking, what's the difference between an entrepreneur and a manager? And all my responses didn't meet his high standard. And he went to a flip chart, which was behind him. And he wrote two alphabets, A and R. And he wrote them twice. And I'm going to cut a long story short. He dragged it on for a long time. But he basically, in the first row, he wrote A less than or equal to R. And the row below, he wrote A substantially greater than R. And he wrote in the first row, A less than or equal to R is a manager. And in the row below where A substantially greater than R is an entrepreneur. And then went on to say the only relation, the difference between a manager and an entrepreneur is the relationship between A and R, where A stands for ambition or aspiration and R stands for resource. Mm. And having said that, he then said the following. A managerial mindset is one where ambition is equal to resource. We are all taught managers manage resources. So when you talk to someone who's in a managerial mindset, he or she would say, if you tell them that I'm increasing your budget or your uh, brand support, they say, okay, I can sell some more. If I will give you more people, I'll do some more. If I'm going to cut your budget, reduce my target. If I'm going to cut your people, reduce my target. This conversation where there is a linear, almost an equality between ambition and resource is the hallmark of a managerial mind. And then said, there is no entrepreneur in the world who ever allows there to be any, any relationship between ambition and resource. Most great entrepreneurs aim of changing the world, dream of going to the moon with probably a penny in their pocket. And they are not troubled by this mismatch. And because they live with this mismatch of ambition and resource in their mind, and never dilute their ambition based on the resources that they have, something magical happens. So I said, what? He says, innovation. They find new ways of stretching that resource to get to that ambition that they have. That's how innovation takes place. 
and when they find that new way suddenly this inequality of a greater than r uh, suddenly becomes a equal to r because you found new ways of using that resource and they don't stop there they will once again change their ambition so the constant ability to live with this mismatch between ambition and resource is the hallmark of an entrepreneur and the only difference between an entrepreneur and a manager that's what he said and for most of us in managerial roles in our companies we keep saying i'm in the innovation department but you're in the innovation department with a managerial mindset what sort of innovation are you ever going to have so necessary condition for innovation he said a necessary condition for innovation is this huge mismatch between the two and i walked out i said wow shame on me that i walked out saying wow but i also said but he's a professor he's uh, he's you know professors have these wonderful frameworks and these wonderful models and i left it at that it took me almost 9 years after that to think about it again and to ask myself when i had when i with my back to the wall in this financial crisis ask myself what sounded good in theory can it actually work in practice that really happened and then with that started a series of experiments human experiments which were carried out to test this and uh, i was just staggered to see how true this can be and that shaped a lot of my thinking and philosophy and uh, management approach in my subsequent years so my question now is to go back to your previous observations uh, when you were in the middle of a perfect storm having taken over this corporation and there were there was a global crisis at the time and companies like lehman brothers had just vanished and here here you were with a lot of internal structural issues and so on confronting and then you had the external issues at this stage two questions one is did you back your instincts and say i'm going to do the right thing every morning and fix it two these were your beliefs and you were a man with deep belief systems and you were running a company with thousands of people you had external uh, constituents in london you had vendors you had partners you had the stock market to look at and you had multiple constituencies just give me a perspective as to how you did both you know it's difficult to say how do you do both uh, because when you think of it like this it feels even more daunting than uh, when you're thrown into it at that moment so That's all right. i would say at that stage is uh, sometimes being in a crisis helps hmm? mm-hmm. because uh, when you are in a crisis you have only uh, you have only one option you have to boldly do a few things otherwise you are going to drown you are going to sink hmm? mm-hmm. so uh, sometimes you can be a lot bolder when you are in a crisis that's why they say never waste a good crisis quite right uh, so i had the situation i had some learnings i also had this deep conviction that i told you that there is no shortcut to long term success that there is um, when you do the right things the right outcomes will follow so all of those are a core to who you are hmm. and uh, i had the opportunity to test them but equally you needed a f- you needed a little bit of luck you needed a great team with belief hmm. um and i suspect uh, a few things falling in place because uh, if i had to try and recreate that situation again i'm not sure i would succeed every time but some things happened mm-hmm. i think yeah, we yeah. crafted a belief at the we crafted a vision for the organization at that moment hmm? which uh, which people found it was not just collectively inspiring but it was individually relatable most people wanted that happen often organizational visions are such that they sound good in a conference room when you unveil them and 2 3 days later the dk has started and people have forgotten and they move on i've been through that period many times sometimes just sometimes some magic happens because it's just right for that moment you touch a chord where uh, people want that to live not because you said it mm. and that happened then our first experiment which we carried out around this ambition and resource it was magical and i think when some when you see this it just allows you to and i it it amazed me through that experiment and i call that a chance because if i just give you a sense of what we tried to do 
In that short period, we tried to see whether how would we how would we turn around performance in the short term. Yeah, that was our real challenge, and that it was in that context that I thought about uh, C.K. Prahlad, and uh, I asked myself. C.K. Prahlad kept talking about bold ambition, bold ambition. What can be a bold ambition, and what can be things that we can do relatively quickly, <coughs> not waiting for five years. <clears throat> because we won't have five years <clears throat> and i don't know rightly or wrongly we stumbled upon the desire to expand distribution quickly <clears throat> uh that's what we could do and um we were always great at distribution we had the widest distribution system in the country every year we would add distribution we were adding 30 we were going to about a million stores adding 30 to 40000 stores every year despite being well ahead of everyone else in those days and i said what if instead of 30 40000 stores you can add a lot more that will help us grow faster this year the question is what is lot more and i don't even know why this number came to my mind and even if i narrate the story to you it sounds ridiculous even when i mention this number tell me but the number we came up with at that moment was can we add half a million 500000 stores in a year now think about it in the history of this company over the last many many decades we had reached 1 million after decades of hard work this company somehow work very hard you bust your gut out and find a way to add 30 to 40000 no mute stores every year because adding this was a challenge viability was a challenge you had to go to smaller and smaller villages economics didn't work out it wasn't easy and here i was with this ridiculous number in my mind what if you could add half a million and i don't know who was more stupid my thought coming to my mind or the team which didn't simply uh, uh give up on me saying that this is the price of senior leadership you get there and you lose all perspective and uh, lose touch with reality but something happened that's why i'm saying i can't explain it and the condition was such everyone's heart was bleeding they wanted this company to succeed we felt personally responsible for what we were going through that counts for a lot and in that context there was a message saying what if what if we could try and get half a million and that number half a million sounded ridiculous but it wasn't as if people had to create new stores shops existed we just had to find a model to get there and frankly as i said that i had no expectation no thing no that you could get anywhere close to it as well <coughs> but after the early shock of listening to this number every time i spoke but what if what if we could get there won't it be cool won't it be fun and i think i must have burnt up a lot of equity which i built over my previous so many years in the company with that one comment but only because i had credibility over so many years and the goodwill that i enjoyed with the team people were even willing to entertain the thought and not call me a madman on my face at my on my face or to my face at that moment but something happened which was magical in the period of 6 months i saw things diff- people saw things different i saw magic happening i saw new ideas i saw new juices i saw collaboration taking place in a way i hadn't seen before at the end of 6 months people had cracked an idea two or three ideas we didn't know we could get to 500 but there was a sense that we could cross 100000 150000 which was unheard of within 9 months there was almost a said oh god who knows we might even get there at the end of that year we actually hit the 500000 it was beyond belief and at a time when people thought that this was incredible and people wanted to take a break i had something else had started going through my mind i couldn't explain why it had happened but i was seeing the company change yeah and i wanted to see i want i was getting greedy i tasted blood <clears throat> so when others thought we would consolidate on these gains the next year 
in my mind was going, uh, there was another question. What if you could push it a little further? So when people came to me in October of that year, I was already thinking of the plans for next year. I said, next year, we are going for another half a million. So that in a two year period, we will double our direct coverage. Yeah. Now the second year people thought again, I was mad, but by then there was a different adrenaline and a magic in the organization. And we hit that number. And in the third year was the wow, goal of wow. saying, can we do even more? But the point isn't that. By in the second year, as we discovered, we could get the second 500,000. And in the second year, we got 600,000. We beat that number. What was going on in my mind were two things. Why is this happening? It wasn't as if people were lax and not focused and were uh, coasting in the early period. What has changed was something that I kept reflecting on. And I wanted to see whether what was working in the sales system could work in other parts of the business. And I tried it in a supply chain. I tried it even with a legal function. And I'd, I'd narrate this story about a legal function because it's interesting. And the question really in the legal function was, we had about two, two and a half thousand litigations, small litigations, big litigations with distributors, some old cases, suppliers, uh, con some consumer somewhere. And I said, how terrible is that? What if we could have it was the thought. And um, and Harvard, I simply said, oh, I don't like this four digits. We should be 999 or less. Mm. And when I mentioned it to the legal head, he looked at me and said, Nitin, what's wrong with you? It's all right when you are in other parts where things are in your control. This is not in our control. You know how the Indian legal system is. The case won't even come up in courts for us to be able to close some of these cases. He says, I don't know, but wouldn't it be cool if we got down to 999? Yeah. But you only, every time anyone said thing, I said, yeah, sure, maybe, but oh, but wouldn't it be super cool if we found a way to get this done? Yeah. And guess what? In this case, this person goes back and finds an incredible idea with, despite our Indian legal system, found a way to get to those outcomes. Why? What did he do? He simply came up with an idea of an ombudsman. Uh, we appointed a few ombudsmen, which per se is not a new idea. We've had these in the past, but he came up with a breakthrough thought. He says, we'll, we'll invite everyone to come up with the ombudsman. And when somebody asks you, but why will they come? He says, because we will make them an offer. He says, if the decision of the ombudsman is against the company, it is binding on the company. We will accept it and we will not fight it in the court of law. Hmm? But if it is against you, you retain your right to go to court and fight it in the court of law. So not binding on you, but binding on the company. So nothing for you to lose. Yeah. Right, right, right. So everyone came. And when they came and they had retired judges and people of repute addressing uh, those, uh, even though they could have gone to court later on, many of them chose not to go to court and settled it. And as a company, when things went against us, we honored it and we mm -hmm. came down. So the point I wanted to make is some magic happened and through that, there were certain lessons which I learned later on. I asked, why was this happening? And the big lesson that I got through this experience was the realization that the magic only happened because I started off with a number like 500,000. If I had started off with a number of 50,000 instead of 30,000, which was a track record, something else would have happened. At 50,000, in all probability, the sales manager would have come and a uh, director would have negotiated. They say, Nitin, what's wrong with you? See, the last five years, we've not, never done more than 25, 20, etc. This is impossible. We would have negotiated. And he would have settled at a number like 30, 35,000, 40,000 and convinced me that it was a super stretch goal. And the 35 or 40,000, when he said was super stretch, was true. The person wasn't lying. Hmm. But at 500,000, something else happened. There was, no, there was no negotiation. Because what will you negotiate? 400,000, 300,000, it is as stupid as 500,000. So there was no negotiation which happened. And something else I found, why do people negotiate? They negotiate because at 50,000, the person would have ex been expected to hit that number. And if he landed at 40,000, he was a failure. He had missed his target. 
At 500,000, no one was expected to hit that 500,000. So missing that number, you were never a failure. But we negotiate because we are afraid of failing. And when you suddenly change the paradigm of what you're working towards, where you're working towards the joy of success, where you're working towards doing something that no one has ever done before, suddenly different, different juices start flowing. And I felt, realized suddenly that the key role of leadership is to move people and shift people away from the fear of failure, which you have when you're working on traditional goals and targets, to shift them to experiencing occasionally the joy of doing things which no one has done before, that pioneering act, because then creativity, new ideas, collaboration, magic, those are positive emotions and positive juices and fear of failure is a, is a, is a, Receive. is exactly the opposite which happens. So that's it. Those were some of my lessons and learnings in that period, uh, which, uh, which have genuinely been transformational for me in this. Uh, uh, and I've tried to hold on to in my subsequent uh, career. Nitin, thank you very much for being on this program. It's been an absolute delight to have a conversation with you.